So I'd say let's go ahead and get started. Uh, first things first, before I get to these points here, uh, one thing that I would like to bring up and everything else, you might notice that we currently have 60, I keep, that number keeps jumping up. We have 60 people in chat currently, or at least in the Zoom meeting, and we have another eight or so on Twitch. Um, I don't know if there's any overlap in those two numbers or not, but uh, it's a little bit difficult to manage everyone. So while we have small populations, uh, I'm talking like typically during like office hours or something else like that, we've only got a handful of people or after lectures or between lectures or anything else like that. Uh, coming on over the mic is totally fine by me. Uh, usually grabs my attention a little bit better. Uh, sometimes I miss the chat message for a minute or two. But uh, when we are in the lecture, kind of like this at this point, uh, go ahead and let's exclusively use uh, the chats. And that way, if you guys have questions, you can throw stuff up in there while I'm talking about different things and uh, there's no interruption or anything else like that. And uh, kind of in the flow of my conversation, I can incorporate those questions and answer those things. And it's usually uh, more of a not flow and uh, kind of a tangent that I get on, but uh, it, it works the same either way. But anyways, um, let me kind of just start hitting some of these points. So, hello, I am Anthony Rapp. Uh, I will be the professor for this course. Um, I know I'm wearing a hoodie and a t-shirt, but I am actually the professor. I'm not a grad student or anything else. Uh, I try to make jokes about that sometimes. Uh, so I did my undergrad and my master's at Miami in physics. Um, I had a romp of a time with it, enough so that I've stuck around for an extra couple years to keep teaching, because I like teaching. It's a lot of fun. I used to tutor a lot of people, and I kind of discovered a love through teaching through that. So now I tutor large classes, not just single people anymore. Um, but anyways, with all of that stuff, I realize I am kind of dressed down from perhaps the occasion, but... Uh, I'm in my house, sitting at my desk as I do every single day. I am sure if you guys are sitting somewhere, you're probably not dressing up for a Zoom meeting either. So uh, we'll just call it even at that one. Um, but uh, yeah, is there anything, I don't know if you guys even care enough, is there anything that you guys want to know about me? I've been around Miami for too long. I like physics a lot. I've done research things and I like music if you can't tell. Anything else you need? I like purple. That's another thing. That's a personality trait, usually. <laughs> Give you like 10 seconds if anybody has any burning questions or anything else. Yes. Yeah. I've been around here for way too long. This is my eighth year living in Oxford. Whew. Uh, do I stream stuff only on, uh, only these lectures? My lectures and office hours, I will stream things. I don't have a second Twitch account because I honestly don't like streaming a ton. It's a little bit strange having eyes constantly on me. Uh, and I won't play songs during lectures, but maybe if you ask during some office hours or something like that. Um, so that checks that one. Oh, and here's our first technical issues for this. Technical issues are going to be the name of the game for the entire semester. Um, I don't know what it is at this point. I've tried resetting my computer. I've tried updating the drivers. I've tried manually going in and changing the logs for Windows, but nothing seems to work. But anyways, that's a little bit about who I am, all that good stuff. Um, so the first thing that I do want to talk about is kind of the setup of the class and everything else. I wouldn't talk about this in 192, but seeing as this is your first semester, in a physics course like this. Uh, I do want to talk a little bit about scale up the way we run everything. And this kind of bleeds into the assignment section right here. So scale up is uh, this idea that uh, we have borrowed from another institution that studied it. Uh, we have a physics education research lab uh, that has done quite a bit of studying on how you guys learn and what works best for you guys and what works good for understanding and student satisfaction and all that good stuff. Um, and what we have found is that a traditional lecture kind of works, but not great. So we don't quite do traditional lectures anymore. We do what's called a flipped classroom kind of style. And that means that we've got, essentially, we break up assignments into a few different pieces here. We don't do a ton of examples and just walking through things and feeding information to you in lectures in quite the same way anymore. Instead, what we do is we break up our assignments into uh, essentially three big parts. 
right? So the first thing that we would have is going to be readings. So the readings, um, if you had heard anything from me about last semester or anything else, last semester I was using perusal. Uh, if you've heard horror stories about perusal, you can rest assured that we're not using it this semester. Um, but readings are going to be listed out on the course canvas page. Let me go ahead and pull that up. So I've got a nice pretty calendar right here for you that's got everything that we should need. Um, so at the beginning of each of these things, it's going to tell you essentially what sections, what chapters we should be reading before we dive into the lecture. There are assignments that go with those. Uh, if you notice the difference between reading 1.1-8 uh, and the in-class, the in-class is highlighted in orange. Highlighted means there is something for you to click on there, right? Likewise with these other things down here. Um, readings are currently not lit up because I don't expect you to have the book right now, right? It's pretty hard to read the book if you don't have the book yet. So uh, what this is going to be, starting next week, we will have actual reading assignments. These will be highlighted just like the in-class thing is. There'll be a couple conceptual questions. Not anything super crazy, not a bunch of solving, uh, not anything like that, just kind of conceptual questions that say, hey, you read through the material. You've got a, a, an idea of what's going on. So that's before the lecture. Uh, during the lecture, where'd my draw thing go? During the lecture, we will also have uh, the in-class portion, right? And the in-class portion is essentially problems that we work on during the class. So you've read some of the stuff, you've gotten a first pass of the information, uh, you've got some of it, right? I'm not gonna say you've picked up everything so far. Uh, I don't pick up everything when I read it the first time or the second time or the third. I take a lot of times to read through something. So you've read through it the first time, you've seen the words for the first time, you get a general sense of what everything's about. Then you come into lecture. I talk about all of that stuff a second time through. Maybe I explain it a different way, maybe I approach it from a different angle, but whatever the case is, if you have any confusions, you can ask me about those things at that point and we can make sure you're at least solid on the conceptual side of things. And then we start practicing the solving side of things. So you'll have seen an example or two in the book and I'm not gonna go through a bunch of examples myself, right? we're actually finding that uh, for student understanding, showing you guys a bunch of examples doesn't work super well. I know it seems counterintuitive and I know a lot of people have complained about that, but realistically it doesn't help that much. Uh, so what we do is we kind of throw you into the deep end and we start working on, so I'm gonna jump to the chapter two ones. We start working on what we call whiteboard problems, right? And in the whiteboard problems, I give you a little bit of pretext for what's going on with the question. Maybe I give you some hints of how to solve it and then you're off on your own. You're trying to figure out what this thing is. You can work with other people. I you know, encourage that actually. If you wanna post about stuff in chat where you're at, maybe if you're struggling on a step, I can either answer you or you can have other people answering you or anything else like that. We've got a good system going there. Um, and then some of these whiteboard problems are going to be pulled for in-class questions, right? That said, hey, I worked through these example problems. Now, the benefit of coming to class, or at the very least watching lectures afterwards, is that uh, I will go through these problems immediately afterwards on solving them, right? So I'm not gonna wait or anything else to post solutions. We're gonna work on the problem for a little while and then we'll bring it all back and then I'll kind of show you how I approach the problem, make sure you've got the correct answer, uh, and then you can submit that and be on your way for full credit every single time. So. Between those two, now you have read through the stuff, you got a little basic understanding, uh, then you've come to the lecture or you've watched the lecture and you have you know, maybe solidified your conceptual understanding, you've started to work on your solving, uh, and then the third set of assignments comes in and that is mastering, right? We use the service, Mastering Physics, and it's where you're going to master the physics, right? Aptly named. So those are those, those are that. Um, and a great question, is synchronous attendance mandatory? No, it is not. Uh, I know it's synchronous on the schedule, but um, that's the only way that I can actually get a scheduled time. I can't say asynchronous and then ask for a certain amount of time. So I had to say synchronous, so we got a time. And then anybody that, it, whatever, for whatever reason you can't attend or anything else, um, you know, it makes me feel good when you're here. I like to see people here. It makes lectures a little bit more fun and exciting for me, hopefully for you too. But um, it is not required. Um, I'm gonna be recording all of these things and then uploading them to Canvas and to YouTube.
So, because again, uh, it's kind of the situation again, I would love to have everything on Canvas and Zoom, but Canvas and Zoom are a little bit sketchy sometimes. Uh, so uh, YouTube's a little bit more consistent all the time. So, and if you actually go to the YouTube page now, I don't have anything for 191 on there yet, but you might see some of my old class stuff, 192 and 121, the other class that I teach. Uh, old videos up posted on there. Um, so, and likewise, right, I'll still be going through everything. The only difference in that one is that you can't ask me questions in the moment, uh, but if you still have some questions, you're welcome to stop by some of the office hours that will be scheduled, but not right now, um, or to just send me an email anytime. Um, so yeah, you are welcome to be on either Zoom or Twitch. Um, I record these things locally. I don't record them through Zoom. Just that way, uh, we don't run into issues again. Zoom drops the resolution of things, and that makes it hard to read. So, um... Yeah, you're welcome to be on either one, or if it's not convenient to attend lectures, you don't have to be on either one. That's recordings. Now for the book and mastering all of that good stuff, let me go ahead and dive in. So here's how it is. Um, mastering is uh, a mess. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be level with you. It's better than WebAssign. It's a lot better than WebAssign. But Pearson has this really dumb thing where they have mastering physics, the old version, and then they have Mastering Physics, the new version. And then they have my lab in Mastering, a newer version. Uh, and you can make an account on one of those and they don't transfer over and they're completely separate services that are still floating around for some reason. I don't know what it is. Um, but um, what we've got here to make this as easy as possible, on the homepage, this button right here, Mastering Physics, if you click on this button, this will take you right to the right page. Right? And another problem is if you go on the wrong one, if you go on Mastering Physics, for example, if we look up just regular Mastering Physics, this leads you to, like, that's the MyLab and Mastering, but here's another one that looks uh, almost identical. It's a little bit different, but this is the old one, and they don't tell you it's the old one and it doesn't work anymore. They just like to let you suffer, I guess. So, anyways, what we're going for in this one is we want to, uh, if you haven't already, Go ahead and register for this stuff. You are students, right? So you'll register with a student. You'll say, okay, register now. What we need to do is we need to go to the syllabus. The syllabus has our course code for this thing, right? And go ahead and read through this if you haven't already. Course code is right here. My last name with some numbers. Continue. You'll have to probably, unless you have one already, create an account. Uh, at which point, um, let me blank this real fast because I don't know what it's going to do with the autofill and I don't want to, uh, just send out all of my, uh, all of my information. So I'm putting in totally fake email to, yep, 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 from this website, yep. Okay, I just wanted to make sure there's not a lot of autofill things or anything else. Go ahead and use your school email for this though and put in, do me a huge favor, um, put in your name as it appears on Canvas for this. That just, it, it makes uh, the bookkeeping so much easier. It's uh, uh, just a, an easier thing to deal with. We can do any of these things. What is my account security hints? I don't know. Do not use special care. <sighs> Bam. All that good stuff, register the account, everything else like that. And once you do that, you will be presented with a page that looks like this. So this is where your options come in. I do not care how you get the book. Um, whichever way works for me. The only thing I'm absolutely going to require, we need to have mastery. So um, if you want to buy a physical copy of the book, I am told that the physical copies of the book still come with access codes. Um, and check that in the description of wherever you're buying it from just to be sure that it actually does because I don't know how much I trust my rep. But anyways, uh, we absolutely need to have max mastering access as like a, a hard minimum. If you're looking for the hard copy of the book, it looks like this, right? It is the Randy Knight fourth edition of physics for scientists and engineers because most of you are scientists and engineers. 
Um, if you're planning on taking Physics 192, I would recommend the 24-month version because we use the exact same book and the exact same mastering for both. Right, so there's not anything you would have to buy for next semester, at the very least. Um, if you're only taking 191, I know there are a few people that only need 191, you can uh, go with the 18-week if you feel comfortable with that. Um, the difference between e-text and without e-text is the e-text is literally the textbook online. So that's a quick, instant option to get it if you need it, or if you'd prefer to have the hard copy, go that route and it should have access with it as well. But whichever of these options apply to you, go ahead and go through with that one. And then once you go through that, put in those last couple things, uh, you should be all set. You'll be in the course and everything will be all right. So I think that's mastering the book. Um, I know some people were asking last section about the exams. So for all of the exams, we have three exams during the semester. So three midterms that are all covering about three or four chapters each. Uh, and these will be well ahead of time. And then we have one comprehensive final. And I know a lot of people groan as soon as they hear comprehensive final, but I promise it's in your best interest. Oh, hopefully there's not too many lagging issues. But uh, I imagine Zoom is getting swamped today. Um, the comprehensive exam is, uh, in your favor. I promise though, you will, you will find, you will much prefer it by the end of the semester than had it only been on the, the last stuff we covered since exam three. Uh, for your benefit though, of these three midterm exams, we do drop the lowest exam, right? So they are all pretty hefty parts of your grade, but, uh, if you have just a bad day with one of those things, that's all right. Right, that's not gonna hit you too hard or anything else. We will drop that lowest exam and you can be set on just the other two. Uh, in fact, I've actually had a few students that uh, felt really good about exam one and two and totally skipped exam three. And that's fine by me, right? If you feel comfortable with your grade and everything else and uh, you're like, ah, no improving perfection, then that take that weight off your shoulders. Um, but because we do drop the lowest exam and everything else, we try to have zero makeup exams or anything else. I will post these exam dates well ahead of time so you can plan out for them. Um, and in addition to that, they are going to be open for a small window, probably 24 hours, maybe 36. Um, just that way, because again, I know a lot of people are kind of all around the world trying to take this course. So, uh, you know, that'll take care of that. Take it whenever it's convenient, and then if there is a time conflict or anything else, you can hopefully, you don't have a full 24 hours booked out for you. I will not be using any sort of online proctoring things. Um, I know there is a an ongoing petition against Proctorio on campus right now, um, but I didn't use Proctorio before that petition came out because, I mean, it's Proctorio. Let's be real. Let's be level. Like, it's nice that there's a proctoring program, but uh, sometimes you wish it, the world would just be better if there wasn't. Um, Proctorio has a lot of issues kind of surrounding the fact that not even the professors have access for things. If Proctorio thinks you're cheating or if you disconnect and you get locked out, I can't even do anything about that. I have to contact Proctorio and ask them to fix it for me. So uh, I don't like that. I'm not a big fan of that. Um, what that means is that all of these assignments, um, with the exception of exams, exams are to be worked on by yourself. Exams are to be worked on by yourself and all the questions are randomized on top of that. I'm not just talking about uh, numbers in them, but the order of questions and sometimes the questions themselves will be randomized for those things. Um, and on top of that, there is a time limit. Once you start the exam, you're only going to have so long to do that exam. But uh, for these things, I am expecting you to be using your notes and everything else, right? What am I going to do? I am not going to be watching over your shoulder while you're taking the exam. That would be pretty creepy if I was just suddenly in your dorm room or your apartment or anything else like that. So I'm going to hold off on doing that. And I'm just going to instead expect that you will have your notes in your book and all that stuff with you and write the questions in accordance with that. But, uh, you know, again, I'm not trying to kill anyone here. Uh, it's what I think is relatively reasonable. You might disagree a little bit on that one, but uh, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. And we'll talk about that a little bit more because I know you guys will forget stuff. 
Uh, I'll talk about this a little bit more as we're getting into it, or, you know, right before we take exam one. We'll talk about it and go through all that stuff. The last thing that I've got, uh, and one of them's here right now, uh, but we will have some TAs helping for the course this semester. Uh, we're getting that schedule all figured out. Week one is always a, a hot mess as far as schedules go. So uh, between my office hours and the TAs, when they're going to be available to help you guys out, uh, we're going to figure that all out this week and get all of that stuff settled. Um, and we'll also have some SIs, and they will be around Wednesday to introduce themselves and to uh, talk about all that good stuff. So, I've just been talking for 20 minutes straight with uh, no interruptions, so I'm sure uh, everyone is still absolutely with me, 100% still paying attention. Um, do we have any questions? Is there anything else I can talk about course-wise right now? Anything that I missed? Anything that you'd like me to cover a little bit more? Anything like that? Yeah, it's so you can either get, uh, if you bought the book used or you are stealing the book from somebody or something else like that, um, then you'll probably just want to get uh, mastering without the e-text. Save yourself a little bit of money there. Um, if you don't have the book and you are totally fine with e-texts, then go ahead and get mastering with the e-text. If you like to have that hardcover copy, hardcover copy, and I understand that because I usually love to have physical books myself. Um, it should come with an access code. Be sure on that one. If it's a used book, the access code might already be used, though. So watch out for that stuff. Um, the I, I, the book is technically required. There are a bunch of conceptual questions. If you are super confident in your physics concepts or if you have watched the entire Khan Academy catalog and you feel like you are absolutely ready for everything this course can throw at you right now, you know, before the lectures even come, I'm not going to say you have to buy it, but I wouldn't recommend not having it. Um, using the e-text during the exam, I don't know, actually. Um, Mastering gets very picky during exams. I might have an option to allow that, but I don't know if I do. I know some people ran into issues last semester, and, and actually both semesters before that, um, where they would try to pull up old homework assignments while the exam was open, and mastering does a weird shuffle thing, and it saw you pulled up another assignment, and it kicked you out of the exam. Um, and I'll be sending out you know, another warning about that before the exam. Um, and if it happens, it's not a huge deal. I can, I can get it fixed and taken care of. Um, I think the e-text is available during the exam, but I'm, I'm not 1000% solid on that one. The final is not one of the exams that can be dropped though. The final counts no matter what. And the access code is yes for the online homework. Sometimes I, I, this was the case Years ago, and I don't know if it still is, it used to be that the hardcover copy of the book came with access to the ebook as well. I don't know if that's still true or not, though. They, it, it sounds like they're trying to phase that out. Um, I will post the uh, the IBN number, ISBN number, uh, on Canvas. If you give me, if, if right after this lecture, I'll do that. I should have had that one on there sooner, so I will get that one. That's that's for me. We'll leave this on here. Post ISBN number. And that way we can all just be sure on that one. Um, I'm, I'm going to be level with everyone. It's not an easy course, right? It's a five credit hour course, and uh, I know it's infamous. Uh, every single week I have had uh, a research project with the uh, many of the electrical engineers, and every single week one of them's like, hey, uh, are you still killing our students? And I got to be like, yep. Um... It's not an easy course, and I'm, I'm not going to pretend like it's a super easy course or anything else. It, it really does take a pretty serious effort to do well in this course and to get everything else out of it. Um, and that's that's the material and the speed. Uh, I'm going to try and make that as painless as possible. Um, but what I can recommend for all of that stuff, I think I was talking about this with somebody before. Um, I imagine getting better at physics is a little bit like how I try to get better at music. If anybody has tried to learn an instrument or anything else like that. If you try to cram it before the next lesson, you're not going to have a great time. 
the best strategy is probably taking it a little bit every single day. And I know there's a lot of assignments, so you kind of have to take a little bit every day. But uh, just a little bit of effort working on this stuff every single day is going to be a really helpful thing to have that stuff. And kind of in that same analogy, if there is something that you're struggling with, and you're just beating your head against a wall trying to understand a problem or a particular step or something else like that, take a step away from it, right? Start in a manner of time so that you can take a step away from it for an hour or for a day and come back to it tomorrow and, you know, see if it makes any more sense then. Sometimes you got to sleep on a problem. Sometimes you got to sleep on a concept or something else like that for it to really start to sink in. Um, and if you come back to it and it still doesn't make sense, come talk to me. Right? Send me an email, stop in, ask some questions before the lectures, after the lectures, office hours, any of those times. Uh, we try to make ourselves very accessible so you've always got somebody that you can talk to in some manner or another to get a little bit of help if you need it. I can't promise that I'm going to be awake at 4 a.m. If I am, well, I don't know if I'll be up to answering emails at 4 a.m. anyways. Um, but, uh, I try to respond to everybody as quickly as I can for those things. If I ever do miss an email or something, just send me a gentle reminder. You know, give me a few hours. If I haven't responded in a few hours, just uh, a gentle reminder, you know, or maybe I'm, uh, you know, caught up with something and I'll get to it as soon as I can. But, um, that's, that's really my biggest recommendation. Keep working on this stuff. Don't, don't let yourself say, I'm going to catch up next week for this course. It's just not... It's not a good time. I, from personal experience on that one, this is not a course that you can really do that with. If you do find yourself caught far behind or something else like that and you feel like you're playing catch up, um, talk to me about it, right? And I can maybe try and we can find some strategies or anything else, um, you know, and e even if you're not behind, you know, you're always welcome to talk to me about any strategies that you're looking for or anything else like that or if you need some help. If you'd maybe like to meet or something else like that, I've, I've got Discord, Google Meet, Skype, if you really are going to make me do that. Um, but whatever whatever works. We can do it through Zoom or anything else if uh, if ever anybody wants to, to meet up to chat or anything like that. Um, there is a lab portion of this course. It is technically a lab and lecture. The labs are going to be kind of scattered throughout the course, though. We incorporate them into the lectures and other things with that. So uh, they're not necessarily at any sort of consistent time. Um, we ran into this issue <laughs> when I was taking this course initially as 181, 183. Uh, it was one of those scenarios of you're like, oh, we haven't covered this in lecture yet. So I have no idea what's happening. Or, oh, we covered this in lecture four weeks ago. So I don't remember what's happening. Um, and instead, what we do is we just have the labs exactly where they are in the content. Uh, so we'll have our first one on Friday. A lot of those are simulations. Some of those will be uh, recorded demonstration, and then you can pull data from that stuff. So there will be a variety of things, though. I think the labs, uh, the labs that still work pretty well, we've got those going on. There, there are some good labs here still. We ran into issues a few years ago where people were buying a bunch of different things that were similar but not quite the right thing. And just through all of that, this is... Uh, trying to make sure that we cause as little confusion as possible. So that's why it's, it's yeah, it's demonstrating kind of through the first lecture and everything else is normally we'd all be sitting down, but, uh, you know, to talk about this stuff, but this is as close as we can get with that stuff, just kind of talking through it. But I'll, I'll have that ISBN number posted here as well for that stuff. Um, I think the bookstore should still have it but it's not listed through the, the eCampus thing. And, and as for that conversation in Twitch chat, yes, that is the correct book. Physics for Scientists and Engineers, fourth edition by, it's Randall Knight on the, on the book cover, but it's, he always goes by Randy. Uh, there's not a format for the labs. They're very informal. It's mostly filling in all those details and everything else. I'd, I'd, I'll have like worksheets for it all. So sometimes it'll ask you to use Excel or something, you know, Excel equivalent, stuff like that. The labs will not have any in-person components, though. We are a fully online course. I, feel free to email me about anything. Uh, I, I think my, my general sense on this is take the course seriously, but you don't have to take me too seriously or anything else. I'm clearly not going to be very formal or anything else. 
you can call me Anthony. Some people like to call me Professor Rap anyways. That's fine. I don't have a doctorate, so calling me doctor is not quite accurate. Uh, and the only reason that's a pet peeve of mine is because I want to get a doctorate someday. So, uh, you know, I want to I want to earn that one when I get there. But uh, anything else, if you have questions, if you wish the course did a little bit more of something or another, or if you've got questions or recommendations, comments, anything else like that, you know, you're always welcome to send me an email, ask uh, before or after the lectures or anything else. Usually I try to save questions during the lecture for questions about the lecture. So that's my only one caveat on that one. But I think since we've gone through this whole list, I think it's about time we start talking about some physics. So uh, if you would like to, one of those things that is on the calendar, and I actually do recommend it specifically for today, um, not all of this stuff, but this one right here. If we go back to this home page, uh, you can either check through the files for the course, or you should just be able to click on this link, and this will take you to the PowerPoint. I would recommend downloading this because there's some videos in here that are not going to play through this thing. But you can go ahead and download these slides, and we'll chat about these. Um, and that way you don't have to like write down everything on the slides if you're taking some notes right now. You can just write on the slides if there's any extra details or anything else like that. And if you're looking for little notes during the slides, if this is like this, you can click down here and drag these up. I like to put little notes down here at the bottom for everyone to read. So a little extra tidbits, but I like to include. So speaking of, let's dig into it. I'm gonna take a sip of coffee before my voice completely goes out. All right, <clears throat> so physics oftentimes is all about describing what things are doing, right? Uh, it, it's loosely called the study of everything because it's not like there's any one spot that physics isn't going to kind of dig itself into just a little bit. Because even if you want to talk about biology, if you want to talk about the movement of a lot of these molecules and everything else, technically, technically speaking, uh, all of those molecules are dictated by the physics forces that go in between them. But anyways, um, physics kind of plays a role in a little bit of everything, right? And at a certain point, you don't call it physics anymore because the system gets very, very complicated. There's a running joke that between uh, physics and chemistry that chemists said, hey, take care of this, and they handed off hydrogen to the physicist, and the physicist, because it's two particles, figured out everything. And then they saw deuterium, or the heavy hydrogen, and they said, okay, three particles, never mind, I give up. That's chemists again. Right? Uh, we have our own specialties, even if reality is all kind of tied together technically. Um, but physics is oftentimes concerned with what's going on in the motion of an object. How is the object moving around? How is it interacting with other things? What's all of that stuff leading to? And that's what we're going to be spending our focus, for right now at least. Um, it's describing what is that motion? How do we talk about that motion? How do we characterize that motion? Later on, we'll start to dig a little bit more into uh, what's actually causing that motion. But for right now, let's just focus on the motion. And you can see we've got some examples here. If you're walking in a straight line, for example, that's linear motion. If you start throwing things at people, that's projectile motion. Uh, if you're spinning around in a circle, and I mean like going around on a, a merry-go-round or a Ferris wheel or anything else like that, that's circular motion, which is different from rotational motion, which is something spinning in place. So we've got a lot of different motions that we could technically have, uh, but we have to talk about kind of what plays into that, some of our definitions. How do we characterize that? So first, let's take a look at this. Let's imagine here that every single one of these points, this is happening uh, at equal time intervals. So let's say this is T is equal to zero, and then this spot right here, pen, pen. So T is equal to one, and then T is equal to two, and T is equal to three as we go on and on and on. And you might have heard of these terms before. If you have, fantastic. If you haven't, uh, take kind of the popular definition with these things. See if you can uh, figure out anything from that. But what would we say? Is the position of the car constant in time? What do we think? Go ahead and let me know in chat. No, it's moving, right? Unless there are four cars that are all parked in place, and uh, 
I don't even know what, what, what kind of model car that would be. I'm going to doubt that we have four silver cars of the exact same model and year all parked next to each other, equal spacing apart. Uh, I'm willing to interpret this picture as this car is moving along. And it's over here at one second, and it's over here, or it's over here at zero, and then over here at one, and then over there at two and three, and so on and so forth. So we would say the position of the car is not constant. It's changing, but it's changing at a constant rate, right? It's a little bit confusing. We've got some words to kind of piece apart there. What about the velocity, though? The velocity, we could say, is that rate of change. Velocity would be the rate of change of position. And if it's the rate of change of position, what's going on with the velocity? Is the velocity constant? Is velocity changing? What do we think? Yeah, velocity seems pretty constant to me. It's, you know, equal increments away every single time. Maybe it's moving, I don't know, 30 meters every second. And if it's moving 30 meters every second, then we could say it's moving 30 meters per second, which is a measure of velocity. Now, acceleration's a little bit different from that. This is kind of going in the same pattern. If velocity is the rate of change of position, acceleration is the rate of change of velocity. So is there any acceleration to this car? No. So we've got kind of like three technically independent values, right? It's kind of a weird thing because I, they all relate in some way or another, but they don't necessarily have to be, you can have a velocity and not have an acceleration. You can have a velocity and an acceleration. You don't have to be one way or the other. All three of these variables are technically free to move around. They'll just influence the other one down the line. So this is my first place where I'd probably recommend if you have the slides downloaded, go ahead and view them on your own computer because uh, the frame rate on uh, Zoom and Twitch is not always the best. But I've got a little video here of uh, taking a ball, tossing it up in the air and catching it, right? And it's a little quick thing, but we kind of plot out what's going on with these different pieces. It's a little bit blurry here, but if you can see it on your screen, we have like a 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. We get all the way to 12. And this is an interesting thing. And I want to pause this. I'm going to pause this and try and take it about right here. So hopefully, if you can't see the numbers super clearly, you can still see those red dots. Uh, what we have done here is we've taken a video of this thing. And every equal time increment, we have marked what is the position of the ball at this moment in time. So I think we can all agree right from the beginning. Position, certainly not the same every single time, right? I see six different dots. It's not in the same place. What about velocity, though? Is velocity constant? No. And we don't really need to study every single point. What we can do, let's focus in on, so here's 0 and 1. And there's a, a little bit of frame tearing here. It's kind of like copying over a few times, so it's <laughs> not a great video. But between zero and one, we've got that much spacing. What is that? Like, uh, I'm trying to see what the scale is. In deep blue, it's kind of hard to see. It's a, it's a fair amount of space. Is that the same amount of space between, for example, five and six, or six and seven, which is technically overlapping with five and six? No. Same time increment, different spacing, that suggests to me the rate of change of position is different between different increments. Velocity is different. Velocity is also changing. So if position is changing and velocity is changing, specifically velocity is changing, that means we must have some sort of acceleration. There is a rate of change of the velocity. And the acceleration is where gravity is actually going to be acting on, but we're going to talk about that in just a little bit longer. But it's kind of a fun thing, right? Because towards the beginning here, we can say, okay, well, if we're going up, velocity perhaps is positive, right? Our position is increasing. Our velocity is positive. But as we start to turn around, our velocity turns the other way. Our acceleration is pointing in opposite direction as our initial velocity. And eventually, our position starts decreasing, decreasing back to zero again. So oftentimes, we have equations to describe these things, but that's not always going to be the case. Sometimes we need to analyze the motion of something as it is, 
right? Sometimes you're in a sort of engineering project or something like that. Say you're building a glider and you need to characterize the motion of that glider. Equations will probably get you pretty close to what the actual thing is going to do. But uh, we're probably not going to account for every single itty bitty piece, right? I'm not going to try and model every single atom of a glider just to imagine how it's going to float. That's kind of ridiculous and none of the computers in the world can yet process that right? <laughs> Not even like deep blue or anything. That's just too many things happening at once. So instead, what we do is we simplify the model. We look at the broad picture of things and we compare how well does our simple equation match the, you know, actual data of what happens. And if it matches pretty well, then we've got a good prediction, right? We can imagine what it's going to do in other scenarios. And if it doesn't match so well, then maybe we need to go back to our equations and look at what goes into that a little bit more. We can plot all of this out though, and we see something kind of interesting. Whereas our position would have been what I would call linear for the car, for the ball, it's a lot more like a parabola. And that's kind of neat, right? That means that a lot of different things are changing all at once. A linear system is very easy to describe. A parabola is not the most complicated, but it's certainly a little bit more complex than something that's just behaving linear. When acceleration gets involved, we start getting funky shapes. So I want you to try this yourself. If you haven't so far, uh, you know, looking into these videos, make sure you've got these slides pulled up. What I've got here is a picture, a slow-mo version of somebody dropping a tennis ball into a pond. And uh, technically, this thing is in slow motion, but I'm not gonna be super worried about that. What I'm gonna say, is uh, I wanna try and characterize the motion of this ball. And let's just take it at face value, right? Let's imagine, I don't know, we're not on Earth. We're on, I don't know, Mars 2 that has even less gravity, right? So the ball is gonna fall really, really slow. But what I want you to do is go through this exercise. You're gonna make a table kind of like this in Excel or Sheets or, or some equivalent that you have. And what I want you to do is I want you to take these different distance instances. So now we're not marking things in time, we're marking them in distance. See, in this video, we know the tennis ball is about 6.7 centimeters end to end. Each of these black lines is about 10 centimeters away. So right at this instance right here, we could say it's at zero. Now that we've crossed that first line, we are now at 0.67 meters down. And then when the bottom of the ball touches the next black line, now we're at 0.1, now we're at 0.2, 0.3 until we splash. What I want you to do is try to characterize that, fill in this first column with what times the tennis ball falls that distance. And then from that, take the fact that speed is the rate of change of distance. Think about that a little bit. See if you can calculate out what is roughly the average speed over that interval. Okay. So, what did we find? Um, I'm not really looking for any sort of correct answers here. I'm just kind of looking to see what we got. So here's what I've got. And my graphs don't look great. <laughs> but let me, let me delete these things, actually, and let me come back to that. Let me kind of talk through this. So as I have seen it, um, and maybe your numbers are a little bit different, you know, all of this stuff's a little bit kind of hand wavy here. But as I've got this thing, so I see the release about right there, maybe I said it was 1.5. I put it maybe a little bit later than I should have. But I said 1.5 or so for that, it starts falling. Right there, about, it has fallen the 60, no, 0.6.7, let me meet it in the middle, the 6.7 centimeters, you know, it's gone the full length of the ball. Now right there, oh, too far, about right there, it hits 0.1, about right there, it hits 0.2, about right there, or so, it hits 0.3, right, and then it splashes into the water a little bit lower than that. Um, so between all those points, I tried to plot those out. I didn't do a great job, but that's all right. This is what I got. 0 0.067, and all of this is in meters, and then I tried to measure roughly the time that it fell. The actual ball fell faster than this. 
right? Realistically, we slowed down the video. So these times and these speeds are not quite accurate, but that's okay. I'm not super worried about it being 1000% accurate here. Instead, um, so we can take these things and we can plot these out, right? So let's get a nice little scatter plot and it looks, I don't know, a little bit blocky, but it's a parabola, kind of, right? We can kind of see that. But one of the things that's a little bit strange about this is um, this is falling, right? I'm not like anti-gravity gun shooting the tennis ball back up out of the pond. It, it should be falling. So does my zero and 0 0.067, do, do all of those things actually work in the same way? I don't know. And there's a couple different takes you could have on this thing, right? I kind of argue, no, not really. You know, if I'm going to call zero my lowest distance, what I could do is I could say, hey, uh, I'm falling. I expect to be going down. And if I expect to be going down, then I see something like this. And I personally like this one a little bit more. Just because if I'm comparing to what we saw with the projectile motion before, right, we're not tossing the ball up, we're dropping it. So we don't expect that we're going to see this portion of the graph. No, instead I should be kind of blocking all this stuff out. I'm looking for this stuff right here. This is the good stuff. This is about what I should see for dropping the tennis ball because really that's kind of what's happening here, right? It starts at the top motionless, it falls down. Now, that doesn't mean you had to do it that way, right? Maybe you like it the other way, the way that it's plotted out in the first place and everything else, and that works totally fine. All of this is kind of arbitrary in a sense, right? However you want to do it, as long as you're characterizing the motion and as long as you can use what you have to describe the motion, you're set, right? The numbers just have to agree with what you're trying to explain it as. So I like mine to look, look a little bit more like this because this fits my description a little bit better. But now we've got something like this, and now we can say, hey, uh, I notice that my distance is not changing in constant increments, right? I probably have an acceleration. And if I probably have an acceleration, then I should probably see a non-constant speed. And what do we see? Uh, that's what's supposed to be linear. If you pretend, it kind of, there it is. There's a perfect line, right? It's not super great, but that's okay. It's a, it's a very rough experiment anyways. We don't have high quality video. We're not timing this thing properly. There's a lot of things we're missing here, but uh, we can see a non-constant speed, right? And that's really what we're going for here. Uh, this is, you know, non-linear motion in a sense, uh, because we're not just going at a constant speed the entire time. We're constantly changing our speed. So a fun little experiment with that one. Sometimes you'll find yourself in a situation where this is your best option for analyzing how something is going to move. Right? Sometimes that's really all it comes down to. You can't do much else about that. The equations are always going to be there and try to help you describe it, but uh, you know, the equations are only predictors. And the prediction is only as good as many pieces as we include in the prediction. And the more pieces we include, the harder the prediction gets. Let's put a pin in that and come back to that in just a minute here. So. <clears throat> Talking about all these things, I keep using these terms, and I said take the popular definition for these things. Um, but let's let's give these things a little bit more of a rigorous definition than what we've had. So, I've got these things split into two columns, and you'll notice there's some parallels uh, in a row. So, for position, this is telling you where you are. This could be like coordinate points. Where is your x, y, and z in space, right? And then again, zero might be arbitrary or something like that, but it's telling you where you're at. The rate of where you're at changing is what we know as velocity, right? And a lot of people kind of draw a parallel between velocity and speed, and they are very similar, but there is a very distinct, important difference between those two. And that difference is that velocity gives you direction. That is a key point. If you're driving on the highway and you're going 70 miles per hour west, that is a velocity. Your speed is 70 miles per hour. So in that same sense, talking about distance, distance is a, is a kind of similar thing. Position implies a vector. It implies direction, right? Distance might just be how far the journey was. I could go a mile in a circle and my displacement, my position is still zero, but my distance has been a mile. So there's some analogs between these two. 
Uh, and then acceleration, it, it doesn't have a parallel, unfortunately. Right? It's the only one that's uh, there's there's uh, missing here. We don't have a real parallel between these two. Acceleration is another one that has a value and a direction. It's a vector, but uh, there's there's nothing here that is a uh, scalar parallel, unfortunately. But these are the things that we're going to focus on for these first couple chapters here. So in talking about all these things, one of the things we do need to do, I keep talking about miles per hour and we see meters and seconds and then not seconds because that's not what we actually had here. So we have these things that we will use called standard units. And these are just common units we use. We are going to be using the metric system because anyone doing science uses the metric system. It's just the easier way to do it. I'm going to continue saying miles and inches because I'm an American and that's ingrained in me at this point. I can't get rid of it if I tried. But when I'm doing science, it's metric. So our standard units, our big one that we're going to see right now is going to be meters and seconds. So velocity is the rate of change, how many meters do we move in X number of seconds, then we see meters per second, right? Or if we were to take a velocity, meters per second, and multiply it by the number of seconds we were going at that velocity, meters per second times meters, not meters, meters per second times seconds, the seconds cancel out, we're left with meters, we're left with distance. Just in the exact same way, acceleration is meters per second per second, meters per second squared, that's our common unit for acceleration. Now, some of these other ones we will get to in good time here. Uh, the reason that I've highlighted mass as red is because it's, uh, it's the only one that breaks this. And it's really unfortunate that everything else is very, very solid. If you're talking about a kilometer, that is 1,000 meters. And that's, you know, not a standard unit anymore. If you're talking about a kilosecond, that's a thousand seconds. If you want to talk about a millisecond, that's a thousandth of a second. Mass is the only one that's a little bit strange. Kilogram is the standard unit, not gram. It is the one exception to the rule. I don't know why it is, but sometimes you just got to live with it. So grams are actually not going to be standard units. The kilogram, the full thing, is the standard unit for mass. And I will remind you of that when we bring mass back into this. But then we've got other things, newtons, radians, joules, lumens, uh, I'm forgetting all my other standard units, watts, uh, farads, coulombs, all the good units that we'll eventually get to. Uh, almost everything else, the standard unit is just the letter by itself, right? Just that thing by itself, not kilograms, the only exception. So, and there's some prefixes with this stuff as well. If you're looking for this stuff, it is actually in, uh, there's a constants sheet that should have some of these things included as well. So what you're going to find in a lot of these problems, you're going to be faced with non-standard units because mastering wants to see you suffer. Not quite. Uh, it's useful to have. This is going to be a very, very, very useful skill for us. Uh, I have found way too much of my work has been simply converting between different units. Um, so this is good practice while you're doing this in a classroom kind of setting. It's a little bit easier to manage than, you know, when you actually have to deal with a bunch of units all over the place. Uh, I don't know if you guys have heard the infamous story, but something about, I don't even remember what it was, something about the ISS, it was a multi-million dollar project, didn't end up working because somebody forgot to do a uh, imperial to metric conversion properly and nothing fit and it's a failed project. Uh, so it's important, right? And it seems trivial right now and I know it's a little bit tedious to do right now, but uh, I promise it's a useful skill to have. Just put up with it, get good at these unit conversions and uh, it'll pay off in the long run. But the way that we can do these things, so let's imagine here, we, I've got an example of uh, atmospheric pressure. Say we had 14.7 pounds per square inches. And again, we want to go back into metric. I'm going to need to convert each of those piece by piece. So what I can start with is I can say, hey, there are 4.448 newtons per pound. That's how we relate those two together. Now, if I put those two in a fraction and I put pounds on bottom, then I can say, hey, the pounds on top of this fraction cancels out with the pounds on bottom. So now I'm in newtons per square inch. Then I need to convert inches to meters. So I'll say there are 39.37 inches 
per meter. I need two of those, so I'm gonna square it. Now I multiply this number out, and what I end up with at the end of the day is 101,325, if you do the full conversion, uh, 1,000 newtons per meter, per square meter, is equivalent to 14.7 pounds per square inch. So, you'll have plenty of practice with these things, uh, but uh, use these prefixes a lot. Do sig figs matter? I hate sig figs, if I'm being honest. Um, I... They burn my soul. I I really hate sig figs. Mastering will throw a little bit of a fit. Mastering is going to complain about sig figs the entire time, but what I have found is that almost always you can ignore how many sig figs you should use and put in more, and it will probably be okay with it. Sometimes it's going to be weird with the rounding. Sometimes it does a stupid rounding thing somewhere, and it like sig figs are a very important thing. They're, they're a huge part of science and how we talk about precision and everything else. But sig figs, I think, are important when you're dealing with 10 decimal points, not with two. I just, it burns me up. I hate it. It bothers me to no end. Um, you have 10 attempts on every mastering question. You'll find that pretty quickly. You've got 10 attempts and it doesn't take any sort of credit away, no matter, you know, as long as you're going for it and everything else. It's If you get it wrong nine times and then get it right the last time, that's full credit. Um, you, sometimes you might run into rounding issues. That's partially to seal, deal with that. That's partially also because you might have just gotten it wrong or something else. Uh, usually if you're off by sig figs and it really is being picky about those sig figs, it'll say something. It'll say, you know, like watch your sig figs or something like that. Um, yeah, sig figs are a necessary evil. I, I agree with that. Um, when it comes to exam questions and all my questions and everything else, I have a little bit of flexibility on those. Um, for, for all of my multiple choice stuff, if there's a multiple choice number, I will usually give more decimals than I should. Um, but I always try to make sure that it's not a rounding error away. If you round somewhere differently than I do, you're not going to come up with a different answer, right? It'll still point you to the right answer. That's a good question. That's a really good question. That's something I wish I would have brought up to the A section, actually. But that's okay, because it'll be in the recording. So, <clears throat> sig figs, unit conversions, all of that stuff, good information to have, good things to have. Um, but it's not the only skill that we want to pick out of this, right? The other skill that we want to pick out is estimation, right? We're back when I was talking about kind of roughly getting some of these things. Does our model fit? Do the equations match the actual data? The good stuff like that. Estimations are important. Estimations are very important, right? Um, so there's a quote that goes with this. In any problem, you can usually get 90% of the answer with 10% of the effort. Spoken by the very wise Thomas York and then spoken again by me just now. For example, a fun problem here. How many steps would it take to go from Oxford to LA? That's probably a tricky question. There's mountains in the way. Uh, are you taking the roads? Are you going a straight line? Um, all sorts of things, right? That's a really difficult question to actually answer short of actually doing it, right? You, unless you're going to take a really, really extensive Google Maps trip, uh, you're probably going to have to walk this route yourself if you want a definitive answer. And even then, it's going to be different for different people. Right? My stride length might be different than your stride length. So everybody's stride length might be different. There's so many different things that could play into this that makes this such a difficult question to answer. But we can get kind of close. And we can get 90% of the way there without putting that much effort in. If you look at a map, it's roughly 2,000 miles. And I'm not even going to be closer than that. I'm going to say 2,000. If they want a hundredth place, they can go find it themselves. About 2,000 miles. One mile is about 1.5 kilometers, give or take. So we've got about 3,000 kilometers between the two. Three million meters. Maybe a step size is about a meter. I'm going to say about three million steps. And is that 100% accurate? No, it will never be, right? Because I could walk that and it could be different than you could walk that. But what that has done is that's put us within an order of magnitude of probably what the right answer is. 
And this is a really important point because I see this all the time when you guys are working on homework problems. You haven't worked on any yet, but you will soon. Know what answer you're gonna get, right? Have an idea of roughly where these things are going to be. I see a lot of people that will put in answers like 10 to the negative 15th, and the answer is five, right? Know what answers you should be seeing before this, and that way you can look at, does this answer actually make sense? Right before I go plugging in a bunch of things, does this answer actually make sense? Is it meaningful or is it just nonsense? Right, there's a lot of that that goes into everything that you're going to be doing, uh, you know, with these degrees that you're earning right now. There's all sorts of things. This estimation, this sense of where your numbers should be before you actually calculate them or actually measure them, very useful to have. So, in speaking on that, I've got our last exercise for the day here. What we're looking for, how many diapers does the U.S. go through in a year? Don't look up this number. Somebody probably has some data on this. Don't look up this number. That completely ruins the point. What I want you to do is I want you to try and come up with an estimation for this. And this is where our in-class question for the day is going to come back in. Let's go to that Canvas page real fast. If and I can take a student view for this one so you guys can see exactly what, what we're expecting here. Come on, come on, there we go. So if you go to the calendar and you click on this little highlighted orange thing, the in class, highlighted orange means it is an active link, something for you to check out. You come here, it's a text entry box. Submit assignment. Oh, whoa, whoa. Put your answer in here. You need to put explanation. I need some explanation for you. How did you get to that number? I think the more you look up, the less useful the estimation is. Try to go off of as little information as possible. Right, a little bit of educated guessing on that one from stuff that you already know, but uh, try to look up as little information as possible. Hopefully it was all a bit of fun. There's always something just a bit ridiculous about uh, estimating the sheer number of diapers that a single country can produce in a year. Uh, you know, a little bit of an exercise in absurdity, but it's uh, hopefully a pretty fun time with it all. I think we will probably close it out with that one for right now. So hopefully we're all having at least a little bit of fun with this stuff. Um, it, it's it's physics, I know it is, but uh, there's still there's still quite a bit of fun we can we can have here. So the reason, the, the reason behind your estimation is the biggest thing that I've got on this one. If you've got some solid reason how you got to that number, you can explain how you got to that number. I'm happy with that. So um, with all of that stuff, I think I will close out the lecture for today. We will be back again on Wednesday doing more of this good stuff. Again, uh, just in case, remember that the meeting technically starts at 12, but that's for the 1210 lecture. If you'd like to attend that lecture, you're more than welcome to. If you'd like to just wait until 2.15 to pop in and go for the second lecture, that's all good with me. You've got options on that one, whichever time works better for all of you guys. But I think uh, that's all I've got for the rest of today. Make sure you get that thing in. Go ahead and start looking into the book. I'll have the ISBN number published here just in a little bit so we can all make sure we're on exactly the same page. Um, yeah, and that's it. 